Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Again, it is Editing Janine here with the intro. This is the second part in my Canada Reads 2020 shortlist. I'm letting you know what my pick is for the Canada Reads of 2020. Um, the video that I filmed all in one go was significantly longer than I thought it was going to be. And so I have decided to split it into two. The first half has two books and it looks at We Have Always Been Here and Small Game Hunting at the Local Coward Gun Club. So these are going to be the last three books that are on the shortlist. Um, I hope you enjoy and that you can come to make a decision for who your own shortlist winner is. So we're going to roll into that intro so you can get the last three reviews coming your way. The next book that I read was Son of a Trickster by Eden Robinson. I didn't actually take notes on what I thought beforehand. Um, but honestly, I can tell you I didn't know anything about this book beforehand. Um, I knew it was a fiction. I know I had seen Eden Robinson around before. I think she's also the author of a book called Monkey Beach, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, and so I know her subjects tend to f uh, focus on indigenous characters and the culture, and so I thought that's, you know, really important. What, who this book about is this boy named Jared, and it looks at his life, it looks at the result of his, his parents breaking up, it looks at how he's viewed by his schoolmates, by people within his society, and it had elements of magical realism in it, but in a way that was congruent with indigenous culture and beliefs. And so it was really eye-opening to see how the beliefs play into identity um, and what happens when you repress that identity and you don't get to be authentic to yourself. Honestly, I think out of all of the characters that I've read in these books, Jared might have been my favorite character hands down. And that sounds so awful to say when two of the books were nonfiction, but Jared was just that character was a work of art because he was seen as like a drug dealer troublemaker, but he, he was compassionate. He was so helpful and selfless and self-sacrificing and just like really wanted to make the lives of the people that he loved better, but he had to like tone it down because he couldn't be seen as soft like his mother was teaching him that if you're gonna do this stuff you can't be soft um and we see later on why it's important that he knows that he can be soft but he also has to be firm and honestly this was such a powerful coming of age story i believe it's the first book in a series i don't know if there's only going to be two books or if it's going to be a trilogy or more, I will definitely be reading the next book because uh, this is just, it was such an amazing journey to follow Jared through intergenerational trauma and just like the effects that, that people carry with them. And that's something that's not going away anytime soon in Canada because we thought, you know, once we stop scooping the indigenous children, once we stop sending them to residential schools, that we had done all the good things that we need to do, but there's so much more. Like, indigenous kids make up such a huge part of the social services system, of the young offenders, and we really, as a country, need to look at ourselves because we are failing them. And I just, I don't even have the words for it because I don't know, we just really need to look at the system, we really need to fix the system, and we really need to take steps here in Canada towards meaningful, impactful, 
well informed by our indigenous brothers and sisters reconciliation because we as white as like the white people can't just come in and say this is how reconciliation is going to get done because it's not up to us to decide what has been done how it has affected um the people in this culture and their their nations and and we need to step back and say we're going to support you let us know how we can we can work together through the, through this guide us teach us and yeah that was just a real big sense that i got from this book so yeah a fiction piece um elements of the fantastical in it it follows jared through his life trying to fix his family um his relationships with his neighbors and just you know, trying to reconcile these two different parts of who he is while also kind of finding himself in his culture. This book for me was between a four and a four and a half out of five stars. All right, the next book that I read was Radicalized by Cory Doctorow. Before I read it, um, I had a feeling that this was a sci-fi book, um, but I didn't really know what was going on after that. Once I read the blurb, I was like, whoa! It got really intense very quickly. And there are four main stories here. I later learned that they were novellas. So this is a book that is comprised of four different novellas. They are distinct stories. The first story looks at um, refugees that live in kind of low income housing that is designated for them, but they have to use specific um, kitchen appliances that only use designated food in order to go in them. Um, and so it looks at one refugee who learns how to hack that system and the implications of doing so. The second story is about an otherworldly refugee, aka actually an alien, um, like an actual outer space alien. <laughs> who um, tries to take on the police for brutality and corruption with his superpowers and specifically looks at uh, Black Lives Matter's movements. The third novella is a husband who is radicalized to violence because the insurance company won't approve experimental testing that could save his wife's life and she was, it's basically given the impression that she's just supposed to go off and die. Um, and then the last novella is about a doomsdayer who is preparing for the collapse of civilization, I guess, with um, a shelter, food, and close friends, and basically believes that they're going to be safe and exempt from it because they're the smart ones. I, wow. <laughs> so, I am not a sci-fi reader, but I love dystopians. And dystopian novels, to my chagrin, often fall into sci-fi, and I don't know why I'm so hesitant to say that I don't like sci-fi when I love dystopians, like, more than anything else sometimes. Um, so I will keep those categories separate. This is a dystopian novel and four dystopian novellas. Um, maybe with the exception of the alien superhero who helps stuff. Like, that's pretty sci-fi comic book-esque. I honestly loved these four novellas and how they looked at different populations and subsets of populations during kind of the end of the world crises, I guess. Um, in Unauthorized Bread, which was the first story, it really looks at how pervasive capitalism is and how it really traps people into making certain choices that it's really hard to get out of. The second novella, which is Model Minority, takes a very interesting look at what happens when people who aren't part of the oppressed group try to think that they know best. Um, but it also really looks at um, the, I guess, social currency that certain minority groups might have with the predominant race group, i.e., you know, people who aren't white, I guess, in this case, because all the stories are set in the U.S. 
um, and it looks at how tentative your identity as being kind of accepted into white and not being part of the targeted minority group and how like tenuous that is, how very uncertain that um, that status is. In the third novella, which is Radicalized, this just makes me so upset because if you were in any other first world country, the story would never happen. Um, we have health care to look after people because in most countries in the world, we believe that if you're sick, you shouldn't lose everything that you have. And so this infuriated me and I under really understood why the characters got to where they were. Um, but ultimately, it's also about hope and just, you know, a powerful longing for change. The last novella, which is called Mask of the Red De Death, was literally like the end of the world. So how the novellas kind of went was like, you know, futuristic world, but things are fine-ish. Um, current day world, things are not fine, but it's a societal problem. Third is kind of repeating that except rather than because of race, it's because of class. And then the last one just kind of looks at the complete deterioration of society as a whole. And so basically this guy was waiting for the end of the world and he made a shelter out in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of resources to look after him and a certain set of people. and he like everything was just so clinical and so it looks at this clinical approach to surviving doomsday and how that may or may not serve you when you're going forward i thought it was really good especially as showing the arrogance of the well-off in times of trouble and it's even more apt because I read that before this whole COVID-19 stuff blew up and it is just uncanny how what was portrayed in that last novella could be seen in the real world as all the shit was hitting the fan. Excuse the metaphor. But um, yeah, I, ugh, I really loved this book. I, I really did. And I mean, part of that is because I am so biased to loving dystopians because dystopians, I just think, are so interesting because of the psychological implications of what would happen in this future world and like the human psyche and human behavior. And if you can't tell, I was a psychology major and that's why I feel this way. But like, I love dystopians. I do. They are their own separate genre to me. And that's how much I love them. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Yes. So for me, this book was probably around a four and a half out of five. Four to four and a half. I'm, I try to be picky in the books that I give five, like five stars to. A five star means I basically found no faults with it whatsoever. And I would reread this again and again and again and again. And this book is extremely, extremely close to that. So finally, the last book that I read is From the Ashes by Jessie Thistle. So what I know, or what I knew rather before heading into this book is it is a nonfiction book. It was only one of two nonfiction on this list. I am quite certain that it has to do with growing up as a Métis. Um, so then when I read the blurb, um, Jessie, who is not a girl, I was definitely under the impression that Jessie was a girl before I <laughs> looked into it, um, was a high school dropout and is now actually a rising Indigenous scholar within Canada. Um, this is his story about how he overcame trauma and addiction and to discover the truth of, of who he is and to, to find his identity. He's actually Métis Cree and he was abandoned by his, uh, his parents. He was in foster care 
with his brothers. He ended up being with his paternal grandparents. He had a drug addicted father in his life. His grandparents ascribed to the tough love ideology. And so he turned to a life of drugs, alcohol, and petty crime. It talks about past um, abuse endured and learned truths. It explores the impacts of prejudice and racism, as well as love and support, and finding happiness despite the odds. This was another um, really emotional book, because as I said in Son of a Trickster, this is a non-fiction piece, not a fiction piece, and it shows you how hard and how tough life is for Indigenous people in Canada and how we did so much damage being so thoughtless and careless in our past and just seeing the effects that are still on all generations that are alive today from the youth to the teens so younger youth <laughs> to teens, to young adults, to parents, to grandparents, is just, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And it's something that I know we just need to support and we need to be powerful allies. We cannot fully lead the change because we have to be taught how we can make amends and how we can fix what we've damaged but also realize that we can't fully fix everything ourselves and honestly Jesse's story was just it was hard it was so hard because you see as a kid that his dad was so into drugs that he left his sons and at one point Jesse goes it must have been my fault that my dad left me. And the fact that those thoughts go through a child's head honestly broke my heart into a thousand pieces. And, and then even worse is right after that, there was someone who went out of their way to find these three brothers for foster care and sexually abused all three of them. And No child should ever have to go through that. And you just see these themes throughout his story. Like, him and his brothers thought they had to gobble up all of the food, even when they were somewhere safe and stable, because they grew up not knowing when they were going to get their next meal, or where it was going to come from, or just... Ugh. I'm sorry. It was just things that no child should have to go through. And we failed them in such a way that, you know, their lives took these dramatically different turns. And so, <sighs> this is a story of a young man who is so strong and so resilient. And despite the cards that were dealt to him, made every attempt to continue to overcome and just all I can think of is that you know he will continue to rise and so finding the strength to do what he needed to do which at one point was actually get arrested so he could care for himself was just these are struggles that some of the struggles that Jesse went through in his life I can see bits and pieces in other people's lives, but I've never seen anyone who had to go through all of them at once. And oh, and I think the world is so much the better for having him and for having him share his story and to highlight just how we have to support our indigenous brothers and sisters and um, it was not easy I imagine for Jesse to share his story because 
he really doesn't hold back and you know when he was good he was good but when he was bad he was really bad and he doesn't try to gloss over the fact that you know he wasn't just always a good person he was he had bad times too and and it all made him who he is and so oh this was a really powerful book that actually spurned me to um read more nonfiction specifically about indigenous individuals and communities within Canada and um, I think that's something I'll probably be taking with me the rest of this year because it just his Jesse's story hit me so much that I was compelled and I am compelled to continue to go out of my way and being uncomfortable and seeing how we have failed and learning as much as I can so that when the day comes to step up and support and to you know continue to fight for equality and fair treatment of indigenous people i'm gonna have so much knowledge and i'm i've always been an ally but it's going to be even more so in the future because i'm armed with this knowledge and these experiences and the secondhand heartbreak of of what they have to go through so this book was a four to a four and a half for me as well. It very much weighed on my heart and my mind and it still continues to, to this day. And I think sometimes that those are really the types of books that we need, the ones that haunt us afterwards and just refuse to leave us alone because we know that there's more for us to do and that there's a calling for us to do it. Whew. Wow. <laughs> okay. I was definitely not expecting to get so emotional as I did um, a few times there. But, um, yeah, these were five really powerful books. And I can see why these were chosen for the CBC Reads shortlist. I know there was a long list as well. I think of about 15 to 20 books. I didn't have the time or the willpower to read that many, but these books are on here for a reason. I honestly feel that all of them were powerful in their own way. Some of them I just felt differently about than others, which is to be expected because they're not all the same stories, but they all kind of stick with you in their own way. So I will be honest with you, before I started filming this video, so I actually had no idea which book I was going to pick for the winner of this CBC Canada Reads 2020. It's... You heard me go on and on about all of these books and just... They're so important and you should read all of them. That's like, that is a fact. Um, I don't want to make a decision. But I have to. I told myself I was going to do this. <sighs> the book that I pick to be the CBC Canada Reads 2020 pick for this year is Radicalized by Cory Doctorow. So congratulations to you. Um, it was just, I think the fact that I got four very different perspectives that were so, like, that were very well done, but in a very succinct amount of time, just really stood out with me. And I do understand that some people might think that that's cheating because it's novellas or, like, short stories with them to create a book. I mean, it's my favorite genre, dystopian. My other favorite genre is classics. Don't ask me how I got from one to the other. But just the emphasis and the look at kind of each different life was really really interesting to me that being said if i had to pick a runner up the runner up The runner-up would be From the Ashes by Jesse Thistle. There are very few books where I have rooted for another human being more than I have rooted in this book. And don't get me wrong, I want everyone to succeed, but... 
the amount of manure that Jesse shoveled or emerged from over the course of his relatively young life is just insane. And that book is not for the faint of heart by any means. It also probably needs content warnings for sexual assault, um, substance abuse for both drugs and alcohol, intergenerational trauma. It's, uh, I don't know how CBC Reads are going to pick one winner because I already just want to pick those two and say here, but honestly all of them deserve so much credit. Um, the authors told such powerful important stories that Canada needs to hear right now and so I really like my hat is off to you because I don't think I could ever write a book that would be in in this competition and so just wow just I was blown away by the talent that we have and by the stories that we need to tell and yeah that's where I've come to now my that is the close of my CBC Canada Reads 2020 one woman judging panel. Thank you for sticking with me. I know it's been a super long video. I'm likely gonna split it into two. I have no idea because it's a lot of footage and it's a lot of talking and it's a lot of processing as you're watching me. So, um, yeah you need to read these books. I don't care if you're from Canada or not, but especially if you are from Canada. There's a lot here and just to learn, to celebrate, to be proud of. And um, I'm really, really, really glad that I got to read these books this year. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here. I will list the books in the description below so that you can go out and find them yourself if you're so inclined. And I think that perhaps I will also update these videos after Canada Reads is done so I will reflect who the actual winner was and you can see from there. Thank you so much for being here and I hope you guys have an amazing day and that you wash your hands and stay safe. <laughs>